Well, thank you again for coming to uh, my part four and final uh, intro to eBird lecture. Um, this lecture, I, I guess I wouldn't say is necessarily an intro to eBird, but uh, this uh, encapsulates the uh, the name of the title in the series. So I'll talk about um, uh, tips, tricks, and the science behind it, um, behind all the data that's being collected. Um, so again, it is an advanced uh, lecture and you kind of need to understand eBird um, for, for this to uh, make sense. If you don't know eBird though that well, um, you, you'll still learn plenty from this. So um, don't, don't be afraid to, to stick around. Um, I'm gonna, here's the topics to be discussed today. Uh, I'll show you how to summarize your observations. Um, I'll go through the stats and trends. I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on this. Um, this is a, a major uh, category uh, within eBird. When you look at the top left, you have submit, explore, um, my eBird and science, and within science and stats and trends. I'll uh, go over a couple more eBird location tips, um, kind of like location maintenance. Um, and then I will share an eBird sheet with you. Um, this is where um, uh, you go from a birder to an addicted birder. Um, I'm not there yet, but I could maybe be there eventually. Uh, and then I'll talk about becoming a better birder um, by sound. Um, and then of course we'll end with questions, but if you have any questions at any point, uh, please feel free to ask them um, and I'll address them and hopefully answer your question. Um, I'm gonna deviate a little bit from this and I'm gonna talk about a couple of rare birds in the Milwaukee, Southeast Wisconsin area, cause that's exciting. And we had a question about that before. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and share the screen. Um, don't wanna cheat by showing you what I've looked up so far. All right. Um, just a second. Ah, I have so many tabs open. All right, here we go. All right, so I'm gonna go through some rare birds in, in, in uh, uh, Milwaukee in the past couple of days. Uh, so if I move this out of the way. Um, so there's a question about the yellow-throated warbler if that's ever been seen in Milwaukee before. Uh, so what you're going to do if you're, if you're uh, wondering about that question is you're going to go to the Explorer Regions tab in uh, eBird and you're going to look up Milwaukee. I, I'm not sure if this is Milwaukee County or the city of Milwaukee. I'm guessing Milwaukee County when you look up this region. Um, and you're going to see right now all the data is for all, it's set to all years. Um, in Milwaukee, and we've seen 353 species uh, in Milwaukee throughout all the data that's been collected. Uh, so what you're going to do um, is uh, you could either have selected last scene or first scene, but basically I'm going to do control F, and uh, you can see I've already typed it in yellow throated warbler, and you're going to see immediately that it was last seen three days ago um, by Jeremy Meyer, and you're wondering where that is in Milwaukee, you can click on the date. We're going to click on the date here, and we're going to scroll down to where he, uh, Jeremy saw the yellow-throated warbler. And it is a rare bird, so they left a uh, short description about what type of bird it is. Um, and yes, this describes a yellow-throated warbler. Um, so, uh, what an interesting question that we, we've had that uh, within the past three days here in Milwaukee. Um, so one was seen and it was seen at Grant Park, uh, which is in Milwaukee County, uh, Wisconsin. Um, so uh, that's pretty cool. So you could go to Grant Park and possibly see it. However, we could look up to see how many other people have seen uh, a yellow throated warbler uh, recently. If you go to the Explorer tab, uh, go to species maps, uh, type in yellow throated warbler. I am going to uh, load. I'm going to go to date and go to year round current year because I'm interested in if I want to see it soon. Now that we know that it has occurred in Wisconsin, and you're going to zoom in 
to where to Wisconsin to Milwaukee. Keep going in. So here's that one hot spot that Jeremy saw the uh, yellow throat warbler. It looks like they were the only person to see it. We see another recent one um, was seen uh, uh, that April. Yes, that was an end of April at one point. Um, so it has been seen um, quite a bit this, well, not quite a bit, but it has been seen around the Milwaukee area this year. Um, looks like we have one up over here. Uh, this is at Kohler Andre State Park, and there's a photo. Um, that's in early May. So this is a really good way of, of seeing, like, now that you know that it's been seen uh, in the location that you could potentially go, um, um, uh, and then you can find that specific location and how many people have seen that. So um, another rare bird uh, that was seen, let me look at my, um, a western tanager was seen recently. Um, so again, if I'm in species map from the explore button, I'm going to type in the Western Tanager. Um, and that was seen in Ozaki County. Um, uh, I think there's a more recent one. Yeah, here we go. Um, that was seen a couple days ago. Um, and uh, their range of the Western Tanager is obviously out west. And so it's pretty far out of its range to be uh, in Milwaukee. Again, I have it set to year round current. Um, so I'm seeing current data from this year. I could look at all years and see how many times we've seen the Western Tanager. Uh, in Milwaukee, it looks like uh, it's been seen at Havenwoods before in 2006, uh, 1998 in Lake Park. So it definitely is a pretty rare bird uh, to be showing up uh, in the Milwaukee area. And so, yeah, I guess that's pretty surprising to see uh, uh, three different uh, recordings this year of uh, Western Tanager. Yep, these are all 2020. Um, so uh, that's fun to look at. Uh, and then the other one I want to talk about is the blue grosbeak uh, that has been showing up uh, in the area as well. Um, I, I'm interested, I actually don't know how many times we've seen it year, or throughout all data in Milwaukee area. And it looks like um, a handful of times, 2011, 2012, uh, 2004 over there, um, Warmond was seen in the past couple of years, um, and then uh, looking here at Spirit Lake in Ozaki County, it looks like a lot of people were going out to uh, spot the blue gross beak. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of a way to um, find where those rare birds are. Again, I have uh, the email alert set up to my email, so I get notifications uh, from Milwaukee County and from the state. Um, for this purpose. And so uh, when you can look that up. Uh, you can look up the specific species and then um, within the explore species maps area to see exactly where they've been seen. Um, all right, moving on to summarizing observations. Um, I, I decided to add this in based on the backyard breeding blitz and, and, and how do you summarize a lot of data quickly or just to get a brief observation of may, maybe your yard list or um, a specific park that you've been going to and that you're interested in. Um, so uh, this can be helpful in a variety of different ways. Uh, so what you're going to go to is you're going to go to My eBird. Um, just remember I'm on our Urban Ecology Center account, so we have a, uh, a lot of species I'm seeing. These were not seen by me only. And you're going to go in the in the right hand side, you're gonna see summarize my observations here and you're gonna click on that. I'm gonna take you through as if uh, I'm summarizing data for the backyard burning puts and then maybe I'll do an example as if it's um, your yard or something like that. So uh, the backyard burning puts took place on May 9th of 2020. I'm gonna do a week report for May 9th of 2020 and I'm gonna click continue. Um, so because we had a lot of people sending in locations and sharing it with us, I have a ton of locations and I'm wanting to summarize all the data from all the people who sent me the checklist. So I'm going to select the very top one and at the very bottom, I'm going to hold shift. Right now you can't see I'm holding shift, but I'm holding the shift key. I'm going to click the bottom one and it automatically selects all of them. So instead of going through and clicking them all, I just hold shift. I'm going to click continue and it's going to immediately process my report of a one-week report 
of all those locations starting on May 9th to May 15th. Uh, we'll see we had a total of 231 species um, and 95 checklists. This isn't totally accurate, that's not the actual number, um, because I can only choose a week report, uh, a month report, or a year report, and so I'm getting data from a couple other days um, that uh, were not part of the backyard birding quiz. So if I really wanna pull this out, I'd have to export it to Excel um, and pull out these dates. But you can see a lot of really cool uh, um, observations quickly based off of that one day. You can see that we had 90 checklists, we had over 6,000 individuals and 220 species. Um, and at the top here, you're gonna see five different tabs to kind of look at the data, high count, abundance, frequency, group size, and species totals. So high count is pretty self-explanatory. If we look at uh, Canada goose, we had 33 checklists, that's the um, one in parentheses. Um, and out of those 33 that had a Canada goose, uh, the highest count was uh, 62. So one, one checklist reported 62 species of the Canada goose. Um, you'll see that 90 checklists were submitted on that day, but only 33, uh, it looks like only 33 had uh, Canada goose. Uh, now we'll go to abundance. <clears throat> and abundance is the average number of birds per checklist, as you can see right here. Uh, this does average, um, uh, so those other, what, 50, 50 checklists that didn't report a Canada goose, it's still averaging those. So if I reported I didn't see any, any Canada goose, uh, that will bring the average down. Um, so um, it says 85 here, this is the number of checklists. I'm, I'm guessing that around five of them were incomplete checklists or, or incidental sighting. So it's still a checklist, but it doesn't count as complete data. So that's why there's a discrepancy between the 85 and the 90 here. Um, but out of 85 checklists, they averaged all the number of, of Canada goose uh, and uh, there were it averaged 4.36 um, of them per, per checklist. Uh, we can go to another example for that. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. What's a good one? A white breasted nuthatch uh, out of 85 complete checklists. Uh, the average number of, of ones we're seeing was half, half a white breasted nuthatch. Um, so obviously you don't see half of one, but uh, it was pretty uncommon uh, that people saw a white breasted nuthatch on May 9th for the backyard burden boys. All right, we're gonna to go to frequency. Um, if you have any questions and I can explain it more, just go ahead and let me know. Or if you wanna look at a different bird species example, let me know. All right, now we're gonna look at frequency. Um, and this is the percentage of checklists reporting species. Um, so out of the 87 checklists uh, submitted for the Canada goose, um, uh, 38, uh, let me think this through. Um, Percent of checklist reporting species. Um, so 38 of them had um, a Canada goose. You can kind of see that through the high count. We have 33, it says 33 had a Canada goose. But again, I'm, it, it's, it's a little tricky with how people submit the checklist if it's not a complete, when you ask you to say yes to uh, submitting a checklist. So again, you're gonna see a little bit of discrepancy, like you're gonna see 38 checklists. Uh, in the frequency um, right here. So 38 people had that. Um, so um, this just tells you how many checklists had that um, out of the total number. Um, I, the percentage is kind of confusing. I don't really see where that's a percentage. Um, maybe it is, maybe it's 38% of the checklists had it. Maybe that's, maybe that's it. Um, so I guess I'm not entirely sure, um, but it still gives you a general idea of like, how um, many checklists had that species. All right, going to group size. Um, this is the average number of birds one observed. So abundance looked at all of the species, even if you, of one certain species, even if you didn't see it. Um, but the uh, group size is looking at the average number of those only if they were observed. So we're gonna see the average number of Canada goose was close to 12. Um, and if we look at the uh, abundance, it's gonna be much lower 
because all those checklists saying they didn't see any at all, it's going to really bring that down. So you see 4.36 here rather than close to 12. Um, so it just depends on kind of like what you're trying to look at, what your story is, what you're interested in, um, uh, whether that's your yard or, or, or a location that you're interested in. And then finally, the species total. Um, this is just uh, literally the total number of birds that we're seeing. So let's pick a different example I haven't gone over. Um, so 15 total ruby crown kinglets were seen on May 9th, 10 people reported it. 37 house wrens were, were heard or spotted by uh, 18 different checklists. Um, so 286 darlings, I'm surprised that it's not higher than that, but um, I guess it just depends on time of year and where you are for the starlings. Um, so um, yeah, that, that's just uh, pretty helpful. Let me go back and pretend like this is your backyard. Um, that you're interested in. So you're going to go to my eBird, summarize my observations. Uh, you could do a year report. Why don't we do a year report starting for, for so far this year. I'm going to click continue. Uh, we're going to pretend like um, we're at the Urban Ecology Center, Riverside Park, if I can find it. There we go. We're going to pretend like Riverside Park is your backyard. Um, and uh, now you have a really quick data that you can look at, uh, 20 checklists, 77 species. Um, this is pretty cool to see kind of how it like, um, as it increases in diversity uh, as time goes on through the year. Um, so that's pretty cool to see. Um, I, actually, I wanted to show you, yeah, Washington Park is pretty cool too, the kind of like the, the species diversity increases as time goes on. Um, so you just get a lot of different data here. Um, again, this, this data is really good just to look at. If you want to like do statistics and like more in-depth stuff, then you're going to want to export to Excel or to other software packages to do uh, statistical analysis. But for the uh, commoner like me, um, this is really great data that you can just get super quickly um, about your yard, your, your, your park, your, your state, your county, whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, so go ahead and explore in that. Um, all right, I think I talked about everything for that. Uh, and now we're going to move on into the status and uh, trend section. Um, so you'll see the four major sections are here to submit, explore, my eBird. I've talked quite a bit about these three uh, major parts of eBird. And now we're going to go into the science section. Feel free to follow along if you're uh, on the computer and you can split the screen with me as I go through. So this is where all the data that you're collecting is helping um, where it's going to. And, and that data is helping create these maps and these range maps and these abundance maps and these trends and statuses of, of over 610 species so far in North America. Um, they're hoping to expand to other countries once there's more data as eBird expands to other countries. But right now, North America has the most amount of data where they can do this powerful processing of the bird data. Um, let's see, there was a quote, uh, there was an article written in 2015 that said, um, um, maps are made of ink and paper, but tomorrow maps will be made of pixels and data. Um, and I think we're seeing right now that, that that's how a lot of people grew up. Most people grew up with the, those um, maps on those range maps in your, your field guide. Um, but there's something also funny that the first range maps of birds or for anything were actually words. Uh, it wasn't even on paper. So first range maps were like uh, the ruby crown kinglet is from here to here uh, at this time of year, all this written in words. And then it finally got transcribed to a paper map that you see in the field guide. Um, and now we are seeing a living, breathing map of uh, those ranges. And so we've really come a long way in how you visualize and see uh, this data and how that can, how that can help you. Um, so um, with the status and trends map, you can tell if a bird you're seeing is, is rare or not for that time of year. Um, kind of getting to, someone had a question about, about cardinals. You kind of have to do a little bit of interpretation on your own end, um, but uh, you can kind of tell for yourself if it's, if it's rare or not, and I'm going to get into that. Um, so, um, oh yeah, there, another point is that 
these 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 maps are so important that if you you can't conserve a species or the habitat that it's using if you don't know where it is. So if you think um, I can't uh, some rare bird, um, you don't know where it is, you can't really help it. And so um, with these older maps where the ranges aren't really quite accurate, you might be spending a lot of time and energy in a place where it's not even showing up. Um, and so uh, these range maps are they're very specific. Um, for time of year, uh, location and season is just really important to the conservation of, of all bird species, really. Um, so I'm gonna go through quite a few examples showing you this. Um, and uh, the amazing thing is that this, all this is for free. Eber has a really great mission of making this open source. Uh, uh, their goal is to uh, conserve the birds. Um, they want birds to thrive. And so by giving out all this data and all these trends to the entire public, that will help achieve that status rather than having a price or a cost to access this data and knowledge. Um, so, all right, let's explore the eBird SAS and trends on the left-hand side here. Go ahead and click that button. And you're gonna see we have explore eBird SAS and trends for 610 select species. Um, there are obviously a lot more birds than that, but as more data comes out for each of these birds, um, they'll come out with um, better SAS and trends for that bird species. All right, uh, I'm gonna start out with the uh, Eastern Phoebe. So I'm gonna go ahead and search Eastern Phoebe in the search bar. And it's gonna, you're gonna see quite a bit of, of maps and options on the left-hand side. Um, you're gonna see the abundance animation and the abundance map. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the abundance map and then I'm gonna talk about the range map after. Um, I got, we'll start off, I'll show you the abundance animation. This is a really cool feature. You can see, like, this is what I talk about, a living map. You get to see, um, on a paper map, you can't see this. Um, and on a, a, a web-based map, you're able to see it. So I'm gonna play this. We're seeing time of year um, on the right-hand side move. Um, and then you see where the Eastern Phoebes are. And then uh, towards winter, this is where they're congregating in the Southern United States. Um, so we see relative abundance on the right hand side goes from 0 to X and in this case it's 8.7. So this dark purple here represents um, uh, that one would expect to see um, uh, 8.7 Eastern Phoebes uh, in that area. Previously in Eber, they, they to estimate abundance they would send out one um, expert eBirder or birder to a location and in, uh, uh, if they were to go on one um, um, bird walk um, every day for 30 days at the optimal time, um, how many uh, Eastern Phoebes would they see in that specific location? However, they changed it to now be based off of pixels because um, like, it's kind of hard to explain, but basically now they do it by a three kilometer by three kilometer um, pixel or, or um, land area, that's not a great description, but this relative abundance is at 8.7, if it's dark purple, you would then expect an expert birder to go in there at the optimal time and find 8.7 Eastern Phoebes or nine Eastern Phoebes in that three by three kilometer uh, area. Um, so that kind of, kind of, um, is what abundance means um, to help you kind of visualize and understand that map. Ethan, uh, do you um do you know the so I don't know if you're aware of the like the the two shades of gray, the dark gray and the light gray. Mm -hmm. uh, I, is that the dark gray means there were no eBird lists submitted, so yep. that they don't have anything, and then the light gray means there were eBird lists submitted but no Phoebes. Yes, uh, I'm getting to that. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Right now. So I'm gonna go to the Eastern Phoebe uh, in, in the frequently asked questions. This, is, this explains exactly that. Ah. What does that mean? Um, so this is the Eastern Phoebe map. Uh, let's go back here. Um, so I'm clicking on abundance map. So I, I found this by myself um, within the Assassin Trends. Um, I'm just using this graph because it really points to that question exactly of what you were talking about, Tim. So uh, we're, we see light gray and dark gray. The dark gray 
Um, let me get my terms correct here. Um, is the is that the it is the uh, let me okay let me read is the no prediction area. Basically, that means that they can't say yes or no. The Eastern Phoebe's are present here or not. Um, they need at least 50 checklists within the 30 day period for that area to kind of create a summary of or to um, predict of where that bird is present or not. Um, so right here, one, there is not enough data. There's I'm guessing there are not a lot of people here uh, e-birding. And so they can't say whether it is there or not. Um, it's, it's likely uh, not there, um, but they can't confidently say in any way if it's there or not. And now if you look at three, for the, so over down here as well, uh, in these two areas, um, one and two, uh, they are, are not predicted to be there. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. It's, it's a little confusing. There is like, that's where the value of a complete checklist comes in. So, okay, let me talk about light gray. Hopefully that will like make it more clear. So in the light gray, um, that's confidently predicted that the Eastern Phoebe will not show up in that area. So people are birthing in California, Washington, in all these states, and they're not seeing Eastern Phoebes. So when you submit a checklist, say you see uh, the tricolored blackbird, uh, you know, a list of other uh, Western birds, and then it asks you at the very end, is this a complete checklist? When you click yes, that is why this is so important because you didn't see an Eastern Phoebe. If you submitted an incidental sighting, that doesn't really help because there could have been an Eastern Phoebe in California, but when you submit yes, it's a complete checklist, then that helps eBird know that there are no Eastern Phoebes in this light gray area. Does that make sense? So the dark gray is where there's just not enough data to, to predict, but it's unlikely that they're there. Um, but the light gray is, we know that they're not there because the eBird checklists are, there's no, there's no uh, recording of an Eastern Phoebe in these states. Um, so hopefully that helps. All right, number four is the, uh, I have to remember all this, uh, is, the, is the breeding uh, season abundance. Uh, so the darker the red, the more Eastern Phoebes there are. And the lighter red, like here in Nova Scotia, um, is the a lower abundance of breeding uh, Eastern Phoebes. So there might be like three Eastern Phoebes here per three by three kilometer, and there might be um, more like nine over here. Um, and then let's see. Uh, yep, so five and six are pretty similar. The light reds are just like really low occurrence uh, abundance of Eastern Phoebes breeding. Um, seven re refers, or the blues refer to their, their, their winter ranges or their winter um, non-breeding season. Um, and so it's pretty dense dark blue here in Florida where they're not breeding and they're here in winter. And then you see over here uh, in Mexico where it's light blue, um, there's just, uh, not as many Eastern Phoebes overwintering there. Um, nine is where the, the purples are where you see them through the year round. Um, so in Georgia, um, uh, Tennessee, you see them uh, year round. Um, and so again, the lighter colors mean there are fewer of them year round and the darker colors refer to them being there more abundantly. The, uh, the yellows and the, the yellows refer to where they are only migrating. So you will only in, I don't know what part of Texas you call North, uh, Northwest Texas, you would only expect, expect to see them um, migrating through and you wouldn't see them breeding or you wouldn't see them in the winter or summer. Um, so that kind of is what the colors refer to. Uh, I think I covered all of that. I want to show um, the power of this. I want to show the roof, the Rufus, um, um, the Rufus hummingbird. Um, let me, let me search this actually in here. And I want to show you the power of uh, uh, the stats and trends living map. Um, so if you look at a map right now of the Rufus hummingbird, uh, it may look like something like this, um, where you like, and you could see, okay, it's definitely a Western bird, uh, pretty cool. I could maybe see uh, this beautiful hummingbird um, uh, in the West. 
However, what you can do or what you'll see in this animation that you're about to watch is that you're going to see how the Rufus hummingbird migrates. We've known for a long time that they follow uh, the coast and come down through the Rockies. Um, but how, how can you see that in the static map? So let's go ahead and watch this. Uh, they're starting out here. They're moving up the coast, migrating. We're right here in June, July. They're breeding and they come back down through the Rockies. It, it's a little hard to see because it moves so quickly. Um, so let me uh, do this kind of stop frame animation. Okay, so we're here March 21st. We're seeing them migrate up the coast. We don't see them in the Rockies at all. They're migrating to their breeding grounds up here in Canada. All right, now we're gonna go into the breeding season. All right, they're breeding. They're finishing up their breeding season right now um, up in Northern Washington and Canada. And now, right here, remember in March 21st, we saw no presence of them here. But now we know they're migrating because it's now July getting to August when they're migrating back to their wintering grounds. And it's fascinating to see them come through the Rockies on their way back. So in the spring, you wouldn't expect to see it in Colorado and Nevada, you would not be seeing them at all. But in fall, you would. So it's really cool just to like be able to see their circular migration through this uh, abundance animation. Um, I have another example of the black pole. The black pole is another great example of this. Um, one of the warblers that uh, uh, migrates the farthest, oh, I'm running out of time, but uh, we're gonna keep going. So th they're known to migrate, one of the farthest migrating warblers, and you're gonna see them over here. They're gonna migrate all the way to the west, and then they're, they're gonna do their classic migration all the way to the coast and then come down. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this and you can visualize and see this actually happening. All right, we're in April, May, boom. They're all the way up in the west, in Alaska, and they're gonna go all the way to the east and then come down like that. Um, it goes really quickly, but if you just keep watching and watching, you'll kind of like see it happen. Um, it's just, they come up through the Midwest and then uh, they go all the way over to the east coast and then they do their amazing migration of a three-day uh, venture um, all the way from the East Coast all the way to their winter and ground. So truly amazing and just really cool to see that. Uh, uh, most maps would look like this that you see in your book and you wouldn't really understand unless you really read through how that works. So the new field guide is really these animated maps online. Um, it, it, uh, so that's super cool to see. Um, all right, uh, let's get into the range map. Uh, the range maps are pretty similar. Um, uh, I'm gonna go talk about the Rufus uh, hummingbird for their range map because that gives these great uh, indicators. So again, one is where there's not enough data really. Uh, the light gray um, three is just that we know they're not there because here in Wisconsin, no one's reporting uh, Rufus hummingbirds at any point in time. Um, uh, four is their uh, breeding range. Um, and you'll notice they don't use summer, winter, spring, or fall um, because birds have, birds have such different breeding times and migration times. Uh, um, they don't use those words and they, they, they use uh, pre and post migration, pre-breeding pre and uh, post-breeding migration instead of fall. Like, we would usually say fall for post-breeding, but post-breeding is probably a more accurate representation. So we see they're breeding here in this part of uh, Canada and the United States. Um, that would be highlighted in red. The blue is their wintering grounds, uh, so their non-breeding time. And then their seven is their pre-breeding migration, right? So this would be spring migration as they come up here. And then eight would be their post uh, breeding migration as they come back south down to their wintering grounds. Um, so you can look up any bird. Um, I have that right here uh, when I was looking up the range map. Uh, you can look specifically at just their uh, non-breeding aka wintering grounds. You can look at their breeding aka summer grounds individually and you'll see here on the, the right hand um, side their, their the date range of that expected, uh, uh, expected time. Um, so really great um, uh, tool pack here to use to kind of look through different birds. Uh, I wonder if I have any other birds that I'm uh, uh, wanting to talk about. 
But I think the Black Pole and the, the Rufus Hummingbird are just super cool to see that like circular migration or that like um, how they migrate differently in the spring and fall. And we wouldn't know that without eBird data. Um, so super cool. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about SAS and Trends is um, the, uh, the data that you're submitting has contributed to the SAS and Trends map. Um, if you submitted prior to January 15th of 2019, um, or if your observation date was between um, 2014 to 2019, your data is likely um, in here if you submitted a complete checklist. Um, again, it should be a complete checklist, and hopefully this, now you know really why the value of complete checklist is so, so valuable. Um, and um, uh, some other things, like if it was a, uh, uh, if you did, if it was a traveling checklist and it wasn't like 100 miles in a traveling checklist, it was a, a small area, so it helps to model it out better. Um, and you weren't burning for three days in a row on one checklist and you kind of broke them up. So if you just use basic good eBird rules and data collection rules, your data is likely uh, has helped contribute to um, these range maps um, uh, and abundance maps. Um, so, oh, oh yeah, another thing I wanted to to talk about, uh, uh, just talking about relative abundance and what that means. Um, so we see here the post-breeding mi mig uh, migratory season, zero to 11.62. And so uh, that refers to all four of these categories. Um, again, referring to if an expert bird were to go to that three by three kilometer area, how many birds would they expect to see in that area um, at the optimal time of day? Um, and so uh, for, for that season. So in the really dark yellow areas, they'd expect to see close to 12 Rufus hummingbirds uh, right here um, in that area. Um, so uh, hopefully that, that, that helps um, you understand kind of these range and abundance maps, um, really just powerful tools and helps you appreciate birds and, and their ranges and, and everything like that. All right, let's move on to eBird location maintenance. Uh, you're gonna go to my eBird. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, uh, show you how to move your yard. Like uh, pretend you uh, put your yard um, in the wrong place or you wanna move it away from exactly where your house is. Um, I'm gonna go to my own personal one for this. Um, All right, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna to go to my eBird again. Um, you're gonna to go to uh, manage my locations. And uh, I'm gonna to go to my Minnesota home. Uh, um, uh, um, I'm gonna change the location of my Minnesota home. Uh, that's why I've named it. Um, and you're gonna see an S and P's here. So uh, S refers to a shared location. So that's usually like a hotspot. Um, like McKinley Beach in Milwaukee is a hot spot, um, and then P is a personal location. So no one else has Minnesota home except for me, and it shows as a P, and I have three checklists there. So what you're gonna do is click on edit here, and you're gonna see it's gonna zoom in kind of in general right where I am, and we'll pretend like um, uh, I, I, I don't want it to be specifically there, and I wanna move it to a more general location. Right now it's set at the general location, but um, say I live right here in the corner and I want it to be specific. Uh, what you can do is click on move and then you can, you can uh, literally just uh, click where you want it to go next. Um, so wherever that is, you can just simply move it like that. Um, you can also quickly rename it here, like instead of Minnesota home, what if I wanted to say uh, Twin Cities home? Um, I could say to be more specific or I could write in Ethan's home here and then click rename. Um, so that's how you do it. I'm gonna keep it at Minnesota home for right now. Um, but that's how you move and rename your location. Next thing I wanna talk about is merging um, locations. I'm gonna to go to a different location to do that for. Um, this is really important to do for, well not important to do, but it's helpful to do um, if you've been birding at a, a public place that has not become a hot spot yet. Say, um, I'm trying to think of a park in Milwaukee that is not um, a hot spot. 
I'm thinking of that small county park in Milwaukee, the one down on Jones Island. I forget the name of it, but maybe that's not a hot spot. And you want to, you've been burning there forever and you have a ton of checklists to um, whatever you named it, like my location, Jones Island location. But all of a sudden, they now is a hotspot, and you want to merge your data to that hotspot. So I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to give you an example from um, uh, uh, Minnesota, from Lake Elmo Park in Minnesota, but it'll still apply to you wherever you are. So what you're going to do is you're going to select the location of the one that you want to merge in with another one. So right now, I only have one checklist, but pretend you had 100 or 10 or whatever it was, and I'm going to click on Edit. And it, again, it has to be a personal location. You can't merge um, hotspots uh, to another hotspot. That just wouldn't make sense. But you can, you can uh, do that for your own personal. So it's a P here for personal location. And say I want to change, I want to merge this specific location in Lake Elmo to the actual Lake Elmo Park uh, hotspot. So I'm going to click on Edit. And I'm going to click on Merge here on the right. Um, and uh, I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna find this hotspot. So right now, this is my specific location in Lake Elmo where I was. But say I wanna merge it with the Lake Elmo hotspot right here in that, that red, that orange flame. So you're gonna go ahead and click on wherever you want to merge it with. Um, and you're gonna see delete after merging. Um, I'm gonna click, I'm just gonna say, you, you, so if I, if I keep this on, it will delete this green um, spot that I created. If I keep it unchecked, uh, it'll keep that as a location. Um, I, I think I'm going to delete because it's kind of an ugly uh, name with all the coordinates and stuff. So I'll go ahead and delete that. And I'm going to merge now this checklist that I had here um, maybe a month ago. I'm going to merge it with the hotspot location at Lake Elmo. And you're just going to click Merge. This cannot be undone. Yes. And it has now been uh, merged successfully. And you're going to see I don't have that Lake Elmo with all those, those uh, uh, coordinates coming out, coming out after it because I deleted it. And now it's been merged with the Lake Elmo Regional Park hotspot. And you can see that, again, it's type S, which means it's a shared location and is a hotspot. So right. We had a question. How is a breeding season for a species determined? Uh, that is a great question. Um, I'm, I don't know the exact answer to it, but I'm guessing it's based off of eBird data. Uh, again, and I've talked about uh, you can add more uh, value to your checklist when you give it a breeding code. Uh, like, for example, if you see, I've been seeing a lot of blue gray gnat catcher nests, and I've been seeing the parents go to that. Uh, so when I submit it, I say nest with young. Um, and I then tells eBird that the blue gray net catchers are breeding there. And so that um, uh, then they know they're breeding in that specific three by three kilometer. So I'm not sure the statistics or the analysis, the modeling on how they determine um, whether they're breeding in general in that area or not, um, how many checklists they need saying that there's a breeding blue gray net catcher in that area. I'm not sure. Well, I'm guessing I was wondering if that was the uh, information they used for determining that because mm -hmm. I'm sure that most people don't use those breeding codes. Yeah, that's yeah, a great Eric, question. I, I, think, I think that there's a lot of science that goes into the algorithm and there's a lot of that has been backed up. So uh, I think they know for the most part uh, based on movement, um, based yeah. on past observations, you know, decades of past study, uh, and then, and then there is there are still things like the breeding bird atlas, uh, and other that that are still still adding uh, information to kind of our general knowledge, which then goes into these algorithms. So it's it's uh, I, I think it's pretty robust and and complicated, but they have a pretty good idea and they're able to adjust accordingly. You know, with and a little bit of art. <laughs> exactly. They, yep. they they actually divide North America into like two hundred fifty different. Uh, regions and within each region they have a specific modeling and analysis package for that region to take into account um, all these different things that, like indigo buntings in the spring will eat insects uh, but in the fall they're eating seeds um, and so but that could vary depending on where you are in North America and so that could change behavior or, or the, the checklist abundance and so somehow uh, people who are really smart are, are taking that all into account and are figuring out um, 
things like that. But I would agree with Tim. I think movement and and, and presence would would be a big indicator of that. Um, of, like you'd be able to see their migration range when you only see them for uh, twenty days, and then you don't see them at all. They're not being reported at all. Then you know they're likely migrating through. But great question that I don't really know the answer to. And as a general as a general rule. Uh, in this change, but a general rule in the month of June, uh, certainly in the month of July, June, July, like birds are likely breeding there. Like, mm -hmm. you know, some birds breed earlier, some birds breed later, but for the most part, there are some late migrants, but kind of that mid June, almost all the birds are breeding. Um, and then they fine tune it. Of course, that's a, that's a really wide brush, but, um, yeah, it, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of power behind, Cornell and these algorithms and yeah. yeah I may run a little late for this lecture but because it's my final one I'm just gonna power through so hopefully I'm not too much later all right the next thing I'm gonna look at is kind of looking at bar charts um, and kind of using that I've talked about this before but I, I just want to bring it up again because I think it's pretty powerful um, and using it to your advantage of knowing when species should be arriving or not um, if you're an expert birder you, you would know this in your head but uh, for some people um, you may not know every single bird species and when they arrive or not. So I'm going to go to Wisconsin. Um, let's see, Wisconsin, I'm going to select Milwaukee County, counties in Wisconsin. I'm going to click continue. And I'm going to find Milwaukee County here. And I'm going to click continue. Uh, we'll look at the entire date range because that's helpful to see really how the trend is, is, is moving. And the first one I'm going to look at is the, the red-eyed vireo. Um, the warblers are coming through and we're, we're peaking and we're slowly coming down from the peak migration of the warblers. Um, but I'm going to look at the red-eyed vireo. Um, and this is really great to look at to see when are they going to be peaking uh, in Milwaukee County. Um, and this is uh, super helpful to know that uh, you can definitely see them in early, well maybe not definitely, but you can see them in early May. Um, and then by late May, which we're approaching very quickly, um, and early June and all of June pretty much, they are going to be very prevalent. Um, and from my, and this would probably really, I've only seen one or two red-eyed vireos so far this spring, um, but I expect to see many, many more um, coming up. Sometimes what I like to do is I'll like just leave my cursor at the time of month, estimate like we're at May 22nd. So I'll kind of leave, go a little bit past halfway and I'll just scroll up and down and basically I'll see, oh, at least flycatcher is going to be uh, peaking right around now this time. Um, the Eastern Wood Peewee is going to be peaking soon. Um, but we'll, if we're here, we'll see the Eastern Phoebe. Oh, it's a little, uh, definitely has come. It, has, it, it came in March and April, um, and it's not peaking at this time. So really just powerful, just scrolling through, um, keeping your cursor where you are at that time of year to help you understand uh, what, what's happening. So like the Ruby Crown Kinglets, uh, they're definitely leaving now. They're they're on their way out, um, and so uh, you can know that the golden crowns for sure are it'd be um, pretty unusual to see one at this time. Um, but just the power of the bar charts is, is is very helpful to understand when they're occurring, when they're coming or not. Um, and those little blips like here for the house wren, um, that might have been just one or two recordings um, ever in early early April. Um, so. Just, uh, just wanted to reiter reiter reiterate the power of the bar chart. I also wanted to look, uh, show you the line graphs within, um, uh, uh, within uh, the bar charts. Uh, I'm gonna look up Baltimore Oriole. If you click, so you're gonna see here the the the, uh, the map itself. You can click on that, and it'll just tell you where they're being reported, and they're being reported all over Milwaukee and over the state, um, but. If you go ahead and click on line graph, you're going to see some more interesting uh, data referring to frequency abundance uh, and stuff like that. Um, so it's super cool to see, uh, you know, January, February, March, um, April, nothing really much. And then boom, just a spike within like two weeks, we go from zero checklists. Uh, again, I'm in frequency. So zero checklists here in April reporting multiple Orioles to almost half of all checklists submitted in Milwaukee uh, reporting multiple Orioles. That's just really cool to see 
this uh, visually uh, um, and on a graph. And so you can do that for abundance as well. Um, so um, out of all the checklists reported, divided by even those that don't report them, um, they're saying around 1.4 uh, to 2 um, Baltimore Orioles per checklist, which is really high. That's, that's, that's pretty high, even though it's only one. Um, but um, I, I want to show you a quick little tip uh, to add uh, uh, another species. If you go to, you can compare it to another species. You can click here and change species. And we're going to look at the ruby-throated hummingbird. And I'm going to click, click on it. Now you're going to see uh, they're both checked for these two birds. I'm going to click continue. And now you get to compare both the, so the blue is the ruby-throated hummingbird and the purple pinkish is the Baltimore Oriole. And you'll see that ruby throated hummingbirds are a, little, are a little harder to spot and they're more of a, a niche um, uh, species. Um, but again, you can kind of see, you can compare when they're peaking. And again, I'm in Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee County right now. Um, and so you can kind of see where that peaking is, how it dies down, and then during fall migration, when that uh, picks up again. Um, so again, you can go through abundance um, uh, versus frequency. Uh, birds per hour is their way of kind of like normalizing the data and kind of like um, representing all bird species. Um, uh, and then um, uh, high counts, so the most someone saw was 30 Baltimore Orioles and from one checklist. Um, totals, we've seen uh, over 7,000 uh, Baltimore Orioles um, uh, throughout, uh, it looks like throughout all the data. Um, from going back from 1900, so um, that's pretty cool, um, and then average count. So um, really cool. Just take a look through this, um, um, and you'll see some interesting things. All right, now time to get into the eBird cheat. Um, uh, obviously, listing and creating your own list is really important to some people, and people care about it a lot, whether it's for a county, uh, a green, a green checklist, um, your life list, uh, your yard list, whatever it is. Um, I'm going to introduce you to a new list, um, or maybe not a new list for some of you, but a way that you can start doing this new list uh, um, uh, through eBird. And that would be the day list. Um, <laughs> so basically um, uh, tracking your, your, your life list, you can do it by location, but life list for all the birds you've seen every day. So May 22nd today, um, what is my life list? Um, I'm going to go to the Urban Ecology Center account. Um, so they have a better life list than me. <laughs> um, and it'll be easier to see the, the data. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, this is where you would get really addicted to birding because you're going to feel like you have to go out every single day to get your, uh, to help out those those days where you, you're low on species, higher up or something. Um, so what you're going to do um, is you're going to go to the explore uh, section up here in the top left, and you're going to go to target species um, here on the left hand when you scroll down a little bit. And why don't we do one for um, Milwaukee? We're going to ask them your location. Um, will be year round. Uh, you can put in a different month. I talked about this in the previous lecture. Um, but what you're going to see here over on the right-hand side, midway through the page, is you're going to see life list, year list, month list, and then day list. This is where you can track your day list day by day um, for whatever region you pick. And um, I will click uh, show target species. And... Uh, we have not seen a dark eye. Oh, so I should probably go to May um, rather than year round because um, uh, it'd be expecting birds that we should be seeing and show target species. Um, so these are the birds that we have not seen um, uh, in, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, Milwaukee County for our life list. I guess it just depends on the data that we have within uh, the Urban Ecology Center account. But I guess we've never seen a white-throated sparrow or white-crowned sparrow in May. I, um, 
I think it's definitely possible, but uh, I guess we have not seen that. And so um, maybe on this day, I'm like, I want to go see a white throat that's fair, a white crown. Um, where can I find that? And you would go to whatever location that's been recording those, uh, again, using eBird. Um, Caspian Turn, that makes sense because we're not, uh, the parks aren't right next to the lake. Um, however, I, I would expect us to see some at a couple of the parks. But um, anyways, this is how you can, you can do your day list. You would have to do it day by day. Um, you can't like look at what your day list is for tomorrow because um, you're stuck to the, the current day um, on that drop down. Um, you could export, export all your data to Excel and kind of like do it on your own for every single day. That'd be a lot of work. Um, but this is kind of the easiest, cheap way to work on your day list um, without with doing very little work. Um, so um, yeah, that's your, 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 your ticket into birding uh, extensive birding every single day of the year. Um, so, uh, good luck with that. Um, all right. The last thing I want to talk about is becoming a, a better birder through sound. Um, uh, as, as you know, sound is what a great way to identify birds and expert birders, uh, uh, identify more of the birds by sound than actually by seeing, again, depending on where you are. Um, but, uh, I would, um, uh, if you're interested in getting started with getting better at sound, obviously it takes a lot of uh, research on your own end, but there's a way you can get involved that is a whole new world to birding is through recording bird calls. Um, and so um, I'm gonna talk about sound recording and how you can get started in this new way, or maybe not new way, but if you're looking to expand your birding, um, uh, this way of doing it. Uh, so you can start from the very low end of just using your own smartphone that you ha have to spending thousands of dollars on high-end uh, microphones and recording equipment with amplifiers and all that cool jazz. But for most of us, it's probably we're going to be starting with our smartphones. Um, and so there's a great article by uh, eBird on uh, how to start recording bird calls with your, uh, uh, with your smartphone. Um, the, pretty much the most, so they recommend some apps that you can download to record bird calls. And you're like, hmm, what if I just do a voice recording or a voice memo that I have within my phone? I'm not sure for Android what that basic one would be, um, but that would be a big no-no um, because those recordings are, are, are meant for, for human, human levels of frequency for what you can hear and what I can hear but they're not meant to reach those high pitches or those other or those other frequencies that birds are calling. And so you'll see a lot of missed data. Um, actually, if you just record it with your phone and you really want a crisp call uh, when you record bird calls. Um, so there's some apps I recommend that are really good at recording. And basically what these apps are doing are they're recording it um, uh, as a WAV file or a WAV file, I don't know how to pronounce it, W-A-V file. Right now, when you do a phone recording or, or uh, if I leave you a voicemail, it'll be left as an MP3 4 or, MP, or an MP4 um, type recording. And that's where like, it's great if I'm just talking to you. Like I'm gonna record this video in MP4, it's really great for that. But a WAV file captures all this additional data that makes it a lot larger, but it captures that lost data that would be lost in the MP4. Um, uh, file. So you really want an app that will collect in WAV. I'm, I'm pretty sure Song Sleuth, that app I talked about before, um, collects and identifies birds in the WAV file. You can export as a WAV file, so that would be an app you could use. Um, and here's this graphic. You can see the white gaps in the middle of each note are the result of compression where valuable data has been lost. So you can see right here in the middle, data of that bird call has been lost because it was an MP4 um, uh, format. Um, so you could, you could simply start with just your smartphone. You can buy microphones uh, for your smartphone and then you can uh, just keep going up and buying uh, more and more equipment. Um, but I don't know, I just thought it was another interesting way of doing birding um, that I thought I'd share with you. Um, if you just Google um, uh, how to start recording bird calls, uh, there's a whole slew of data or, uh, recommendations on how to get into that. And so 
um, I encourage you to take a look if you want to get into doing something like that.